Mark Bonica. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Health Management and Policy at the University of New Hampshire. He holds a PhD in economics from George Mason University. Before retiring from the U.S. Army Medical Corps, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Bonica served as the Associate Dean of the Army Medical Department Graduate School and the Deputy Director of the Army Baylor Graduate Programs in Health and Business Administration. And you also host a health care leadership podcast, and you're the author of a weekly leadership newsletter. Thank you. Thank you for coming this morning. Uh, I'm really pleased to have, uh, have the opportunity to share my research with you. So this is, uh, I retired from the Army in 2015, and uh, uh, after 23 years of service as a Medical Service Corps officer, working in hospital administration in a variety of different fields, and joined, uh, took my current position at the University of New Hampshire as an assistant professor teaching in the Department of Health Management and Policy, where they said, well, you know, you've got all this management experience. We'd like you to teach our management classes to our students. I said, that sounds great. Easy. 23 years of experience. This will be a snap, uh, even though my PhD is in economics. And got there and very quickly kind of realized I had 23 years of experience in a particularly narrow delivery system, the military health system, and I realized that there were a lot of gaps to my knowledge. And so to try to try to fix that, those gaps, I just went out and started talking to the experts in the field. Uh, so I created a podcast called The Health Leader Forge and went started knocking on doors around at different uh, uh, facilities, uh, talking to CEOs and other senior leaders in the field, and then also reaching out across the country to talk to uh, senior leaders in healthcare, asking them questions about their career, how they got to where they are, and then about their leadership style. Now, as, a, as an assistant professor, I'm also a researcher, and so I was sitting on, uh, after a couple of years, I was sitting on top of about 60 plus lengthy uh, discussions of people's careers and leadership, and so took that data, uh, and took those interviews, and treated them as data, and that's the basis of our discussion here today. So, along with my colleagues, Chris Mayhew and Mark Mallott, also retired Medical Service Corps officers, we took that data, looked at it, poured through it, and started looking for stories that would help us develop a better understanding of what it takes to lead in a uh, health system in a, as, a, as a senior healthcare leader. And so, if you were uh, to be a guest on my podcast, I'd talk to you a bit, I'd ask you, so where'd you go to college? You know, how did you get an interest in healthcare? Uh, and we'd walk from college up through your, you know, your early career to your mid-career to where to wherever you are today. So how did you get from, you know, I went to I went to college uh, to study business and then I wound up as a CEO of a of a of a hospital. How'd you get there? Uh, then I, we'd talk about uh, transition from kind of your career journey and your organization and your current day-to-day -day, uh, experiences to your thoughts about leadership. And if it seemed like you were being candid with me, because not everybody, you know, some people are you know, a little leery, they're gonna, I'm, I'm gonna blast this out onto the internet, it's just you know, between you, me, and the entire world. You know, some people hold back, but you know, a lot of people are quite frank and, and honest and wanna share you know, the lessons learned. And so if it seems like you're one of those people, you'll get the money question. And the money question is, what's a leadership lesson that you learned the hard way? And my co-authors and I, as we kind of were pouring through all these interviews, we really kind of kept coming back to these answers because they were the highest quality, you know, meatiest kind of answers that we got. So I want to just kind of pause for a second and give you a second. Imagine now, we've been talking for 60 or 70 minutes. You've told me your whole life story, right? And you've told me how you got to be the, the C whatever of this organization. And now I'm asking you that question. What's a leadership lesson that you learned the hard way? So what we're going to do now is we're going to take those, or what we did do, really, was we took those, those leadership lessons and we're trying to turn it into a leadership model. So imagine you walk out after this presentation and you're walking down the hall and you trip um, and, and you know, stumble. Pick yourself up and keep going. Well, that could be because you just weren't paying attention, you were on your cell phone and you were walking and you didn't see some, and you're just kind of clumsy, right? Uh, I do that all the time. But if all of us walk out that door and we all kind of stumble at that same point, there's probably something underlying there, right, that maybe we ought to pay attention to, you know, as a group. Maybe we can learn something from. And so 
leadership, everybody makes mistakes um, in leadership, right? It's a, it's a terribly challenging thing. So what we want to do is, what we were trying to do is look for patterns in the data that were kind of that, where's everybody tripping, right? Where are multiple people tripping? So yes, we had some one-off answers about this or that, but what we were really looking for were patterns. And so from those patterns, we felt like we could build what we call leadership competencies. And so as an educator, I'm interested in trying to teach young folks about leadership. I'm interested in what is it that, that leaders need to know? What do they need to focus on to be successful? So those are the competencies that we're looking at. And we recognize every leader is different, every organization is different, and uh, you know, but what can we look at? What are the patterns? What are the behaviors that we can try to focus on and share and help people kind of uh, be successful going forward. So this is a purely qualitative study, meaning we're using the stories, the lived, the lived experiences of individuals. Um, and we used a, a, a uh, style of, of an analysis called grounded theory, which means that we, you know, myself and my colleagues went through uh, all the interviews and coded them, meaning we were looking for common themes. And then we got back together and said, did you see that? I saw that, okay, do we agree? And that's how kind of grounded theory works, is you extract from the, uh, as a you know, kind of collectively, you, the, the analysts kind of get together and look for themes. And then we take all those themes and we start to try to group them together into broader categories. And so that's what we did. We focused particularly on that question about the leadership lesson that you learned the hard way, but then we realized, you know, we were also interested in things that caught leaders by surprise. So not just things that you made a mistake on, but also things that like, oh, I didn't, I, I had no idea that was how this was going to be. Um, and so we added, kind of added that. And what we come up with um, was three broad categories of, of failure. Those broad categories included self-regulation, failing to control team composition, and then failing to be organizationally <laughs> aware. So what I want to do is talk through each of those. And I'm going to give you, within each of these subordinate themes, I'm going to give you just kind of a, a, a single quote from, that's representative of the, of the larger answers that we got. But remember, it's not, none of these are just one person. It just, we've just chosen the one quote that we liked that we thought captured the idea the best. So within the broad uh, category of self-regulation, the three themes we saw were reversion, not listening, and the misuse of the power grade. So the first uh, theme here, reversion, is from uh, Mike, who's the CEO of a critical access hospital. And Mike talked about the challenge of being a leader uh, because leader, by the time you get to be a leader, you're a hard charging individual. You wanna make change, you wanna drive change, right? You are a problem solver, right? You're a problem solver. There's no problem that you can't get through. So you wanna bring it on, right? He said, but, but Mike said, letting people make their own mistakes and learn from them is difficult. And that was one of the lessons I had to learn here. Right? So what Mike was recognizing in himself is he wants to get roll up his sleeves, get things done, make things happen. Right? You as a leader, though, right? so Mike is saying, I recognize that I, as a leader, have to work through my people rather than revert to a, a performer. Because you got, most likely, to be a leader because you were a high performer to begin with. So is this a mistake, maybe, that you've made? The second theme within self-regulation is listening. Rich is the, was, well, he was the CFO of a $2 billion teaching hospital and an overall $6 billion health system. And when Rich talked to me, he said, you know, uh, the lesson I had to learn was about listening. And he said, I'm, I wasn't always good at it, and I had to learn to do better because my mind tends to go fast, and I would, uh, people would call me a box jumper. I'd know where they were going, and I'd be talking where they were going, and they're like, well, what, are you what are you talking about? And he said, well, I'm at Z. And, and they would say, well, I'm still at B. Right? So he's not, what he's saying is, I'm not really listening to him. I, I heard, because of my experience, I was able to jump you know, 26 steps ahead uh, of them, um, and I already had a solution. Well, the problem with that is two things. One, because he's not listening, maybe Z isn't the best answer in this situation. So that's one problem with it. And even if, but even if Z is the best answer, he's kind of dehumanized his, his, the person he's working with, right? He has not shown them the respect that they deserve as an individual, and that reduces the person's commitment to the organization, and certainly the commitment to him right, as a leader. So that's a problem. So we hear about listening, that's one of the most common ones. Uh, so maybe is that a problem maybe that you thought of when I said, 
what's a leadership lesson that you learned the hard way. The third one is the misuse of the power gradient. And so what I mean by the power gradient is this. Every organization has some degree of hierarchy. And if you are in the position at the top of that hierarchy, you have positional power. And that power is given to you right, to, to execute the mission of the organization. And so Dave was the chief operating officer for a large military health system, 15 hospital system, and a personal mentor of mine. And Dave said, you know, he was telling a story of when he was a, a kind of a mid-grade officer, said at one point I thought, and I'd be very, and I very specifically remember this, that it would be a good technique to be very directive, and very assertive in one particular incident. This early careerist who was the recipient of my very directive and very assertive situational leadership style at the time came back to me about four hours later and with great personal courage sat down with me and told me how that was really not effective. Right? So he had the right idea. Right? Situational leadership, that's a classic leadership theory. He had the right idea, but he executed it poorly. You have this power, right? So, you know, as Uncle Ben says uh, in Spider-Man, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And so, you know, when you have this power, you have to learn how to manipulate it and use it appropriately. Other individuals talked, uh, other, other senior leaders that talked about this. I talked to a chief operating officer named Rob, who said, you know, he told a story of how he lost his temper with somebody who ran up um, a, co a code blue drill in the middle of lunch. Another, uh, another chief operating officer of a large organization talked about how he was just shocked uh, when he got the results of a 360 evaluation back that his people saw him as intimidating. You know, he was a former Army, Ra Army Ranger, and if you know what that means, um, you know, he's actually a really nice guy, and he is if you get to know him, but he's kind of uh, built like a house and, and, um, and, and looks, you know, looks intimidating. Um, so, he, so he developed a, a system with some of his employees that, that if he was behaving in a way that looked intimidating, they were supposed to like tweak their ear at him. Um, so these are things that we learn. But uh, what I do want to highlight is I'm not talking here about abuse, right? This is not, you know, the hashtag me too kind of thing. Dave met well. He just misused the power that, that he was given because he lacked the skill to deal with it. The second broad category of error that we talked about is failing to control team composition. And this kind of breaks out into two related uh, themes, and they're sort of flip sides of each other, but they're also, they're also distinct. So talking to Jill, who's the founder and CEO of a large adaptive sports and recreational therapy uh, organization, she talks about you can find really talented people that sometimes just don't fit. Right? So it's always a challenge to find great people to bring into your organization. It's really exciting. You find somebody that's just really awesome on paper, they've got a great track record, and you really want to bring them in. And then she says, as hard as you try to make them fit into your culture and organization, you buy into that vision, uh, and you thought everything was there, they're not. And even though they're a talented contributor, because they're not buying into that vision and that philosophy or that culture, they're actually pulling the team down. So hiring, bringing people into the team, finding the right people that you need that fit the vision, right? have, well, first of all, like a baseline, everybody that you bring into the team is going to have, you know, you're not even going to talk to somebody who doesn't on paper fit all the needs that you have, right? But it's much more, finding the right person for your organization is much more than do they have the right degree from the right place, do they have the right experiences. It's also, is this person going to fit with our vision or mission? Are they the right person for our organization? Do they complement you as a leader, right? Do they bring the right skills, the right attitudes to move the organization? Patsy, the chief operating officer of a community hospital, talked about her, her challenges with fire. And I've heard this story from men, women, former military, right? This is just hard to do. And it's hard to do because, in part, because it's just hard to do, but also because we are, you know, as a group, kind of self-selected helpers, right? We, we're in this field because we want to help people. If we, if we didn't care about people, we'd be at Wall Street or something, right? So, so, so Patsy says, I, as an individual, always want to give. I want to mentor and educate and help that uh, whatever the person is that isn't working out, I want to help them along to get there. Uh, my lesson learned has been that there have been times, and it's been more than once, when I've left somebody in a position too long. So your responsibility as a senior leader is when that person doesn't fit for whatever reason, whether it turns out that you were wrong about their baseline skills or whether it's that they just don't complement the organization the way you thought they would. 
It's your responsibility to move them along to other opportunities. And it might be that, uh, as I've heard from a number of different senior leaders, you know, specifically when you know, like new CEOs come into organizations, everybody in, that's already in the C-suite is talented. They're they're high they're high performers. But now the new CEO, it's a new dynamic, and maybe those those existing individuals aren't the complementary staff that they that you need. And so maybe it's time for those people to move along. So, is this a a lesson that maybe you've had to learn the hard way. So the third category is failing to be organizationally aware. And there's, again, three themes here. The first theme comes uh, is change capacity, and this is probably one of my favorite quotes in the study. This is Warren, he's the CEO of Ford Hospital System, and, and he says, don't squeeze every lemon at once, wait for them to get right. I mean, when you're doing a podcast, you're just waiting for a quote like this. Um, <laughs> not everybody, not everything's a crisis, and the real trick is what needs to be squeezed and what doesn't. You have to prioritize and you have to know when it's politically right to squeeze that lemon. All right, so that's a good one, right? So, so what he's talking about here is this, right? Organizations, organizations, you know, some people in the room know Warren. Um, so, uh, uh, organizations are, of course, buildings and equipment and people, right? But, it's, but, but a, an organization is much more than that. It's the relationships between all those people and all those things. And particularly, it's the common understanding that we share between those people and those things. And when you go starting to squeeze your lemons, which means, you know, I'm, I'm pushing for that change, right? So I'm going to change something. I'm going to squeeze a lemon here. Well, it takes a time, once you've squeezed the lemon, it takes time for the organization to repair its understanding and to reestablish common understanding again. Okay, so I squeeze over here, I squeeze over here, I squeeze over here. Now you're, you're, you're breaking the common understanding. If you do that too many times, all you're left with are pieces and parts, not an organization anymore. So, you know, going back to Mike's quote about, you know, being hard charging and wanting to change, right? That's you as a senior leader. You have to bear in mind the organization only has so much capacity to change and retain its sense of self at the same time. So is that something that maybe you've done as a leader? The next one is, is about communication, and I heard this one from a number of folks, and it's kind of fun. And this is from Joe. Uh, Joe is a, is a physician leader. He was the chief medical officer of, his, of, a, of a large community hospital for a long period of time, and then eventually was promoted to CEO. And so this is, he's talking about what, what was this, what surprised him about becoming a CEO. And he said, you know, I didn't realize how much things were gonna change in terms of what I did with my body language. Everything I said was amplified. Everything I did was projected. And I just didn't realize how much of that was taking place. And so he goes on to talk about if I'm walking down uh, the hallway and looking down or being with my thoughts, and I, ha uh, uh, I can't do that. I have to be smiling. Because if people see him frown, they say, people would say, what's wrong? Something's going wrong in the hospital, right? So we kind of joke about, you know, he's walking down the hall and suddenly there's a rumor going wild in the hospital. The hospital's going bankrupt. Everybody's going to lose their job, right? So this is, so you have to remember as a, as a senior executive, you're being observed constantly by your people and they're looking for messages from you about the health of the organization, the direction, and so forth. Uh, I heard from Kevin who said when he was a new CEO that suddenly uh, when he would ask uh, people to edit his, his work uh, that he suddenly became a brilliant writer and nobody could find anything wrong with his work. Um, so this is kind of a emperor has new clothes kind of story. And then Gary uh, was the CEO of one of the largest rehab hospitals in the country and he self-proclaimed sarcastic sense of humor, was walking down the hall one of his first days and uh, bumped his head on a door or something. He said, well, that's a stupid place for a door. And next day he comes back and there's an engineering team taking the door down. <laughs> um, uh, so he said, you know, you have to be careful how you use your words and, your, and not just your words, but your, your executive presence. And finally, the last one really applies specifically to CEOs. And I want to, because this is a podcast, I have the ability to share with you the actual um, words. Let you listen to what Peter has to say. Peter is the CEO of a critical access hospital. The one thing that I'm always surprised about in this position is how lonely it is. Mm -hmm. It is a very lonely position. And unless you've done it, you can't really truly understand it. I thought as a COO that I knew exactly what it was going to be about and that I could do it. And what I didn't realize is, is all of the 
confidence I had in, in the way I executed my job as COO was backed up by the safety of a good CEO, that he provided a safe environment for me, and so I felt confident. So Peter had been a COO, and then he stepped into the role of CEO, and he, and he realized there's a fundamental difference there. It's a small step, right? It's one office to the right, but it is a huge step in terms of responsibility and, and the accountability that you are suddenly uh, have thrust upon you. And so this is this I've heard from a number of different CEOs, presidents, or you know, whatever the appropriate kind of top level executive is. And it is it is this loneliness of command, right? The realization that there's nobody you can kick up to. And it is a unique, uh, as Kevin, a different Kevin says, the thing uh, to learn is to be comfortable in that loneliness and to embrace it for what it is, because it never goes away. So I don't know, I know there are a few CEOs in the, in the room here who have shared that kind of thing with me. So that is our last lesson. So taking all that together, what we tried to do using grounded theory, grounded theory, the purpose of grounded theory is to build a new theory. So we, so working with all that information and those themes, we put together what we call the hard way model of leadership. And so at the center of this model, kind of to the shifted right of the center, and I'll explain that in a second, is the leader and dealing with self-regulation. And uh, self-regulation is focused on dyadic relationships, so one-on-one -on -one kind of relationships. We're focused on managing through others, right? So the leader has to remember lessons learned of managing through others, effectively listening so that not only is she or he getting the best advice from his or her people, but you are acknowledging the value and humanity of the people that work for you. You are appropriately using the power gradient that you have been given, using your power responsibly and in a way that moves the organization in that direction that you so do want to move it. Next out is the team. And the purpose of uh, the leader is embedded in the team. The leader primarily works to manipulate and move the organization through her or his team. And so controlling that team composition is critical in order to properly move the organization to squeeze those lemons, if you will, right, to move it in the direction that you want to move that organization. But that, and here's the thing, you don't have to be, I've heard this from a number of, of senior leaders, you don't have to be the smartest gal or guy in the room. You have to surround yourself with the smartest guys and gals in the room. And they have to be the right ones. And the smartest guy or gal in the room might not be the right one for your team at this time. And so you have to control that team composition and you have to recognize that you are, again, back to that, you know, managing through others. You as a senior leader are managing through others. You are, it's not you doing each thing. And then from outside the team, the leader pushes through the team to move the organization. And so you have to recognize the, the delicacy, right, as well as the resilience of the organization. And so you have to manage that change capacity. You want to push, you want to push that organization, you're squeezing the lemons, but you have to get it moving in the right direction and at the right time and not overdue. You have to be aware of your communication styles and use in the, and the communicational awareness is really use of the power gradient at the macro organizational level. And then finally, if you are the senior, the senior leader, then it is bearing the burden of accountability recognizing that you must be the backstop for all of your employees and being prepared to absorb all the blows that go with that. So um, we put the leader, so we initially had envisioned, this is kind of the grounded theory process, we would originally envisioned like a, a bullseye, so concentric circles. And we realized if we did that, that would imply that the leader only touched the organization through her or his team, right? So what we did instead was did tangent circles where the, there's a point here where the leader, the team, and the organization are all one. And so the recognition is meant there to say is, the leader does primarily work through her or his team, but also has the ability to touch directly the organization through communication and so forth, right? And then also, you know, the organization is primarily the interaction with the external environment and responding to the external environment, but the leader and the team also have the ability to, to touch and work with the external environment. Competencies that we drew out, I've kind of already talked through them, I won't rehash them, but three broad categories, each with its competencies, 
And I think this is an interesting model. I think it's a, a, a and these are, I think, critical competencies for us to teach in terms of leadership. Obviously, you have to have a lot of other competencies if you're going to be a senior executive. But in terms of framing leadership, I think these are three useful categories to think about. Are you successfully managing yourself through self-regulation? Are you managing and controlling your team to have the right team? And are you communicating and, and, and understanding and monitoring your organization in a way that ensures that it's healthy? So that's uh, our, our model. Thanks for, for uh, indulging me. If you, it, it'll be forthcoming in the, um, uh, the Healthcare Manager, a journal on healthcare management. If you're interested in hearing some of these uh, podcasts, uh, the Health Leader Forge is free to, free to use. If you're an educator, feel free to use it. And if you'd like to reach out to me, questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you about that. Uh, we have uh, in the appendix uh, the information about all of the different participants that we took from. We had about, we had over 60 participants. We were able to use data from about 35. So that's kind of, that's there so you can see, but you can also track each of these individuals down. If you really want to hear the whole thing, you can track each of these individuals down uh, on the website. So thanks, thanks so much for your time.